Hi, my name is Carol Mahler. I'm an editor, author, amateur historian, and I'm here today to do a program for you called Inglewood Area History and Poems, and this is part of the Lemon Bay Fest 2021. Now the first thing I want to do is give credit to a really wonderful book that's called Florida and Poetry. It was edited by Jane Anderson Jones and Maurice O'Sullivan. It is a fabulous resource and I am so grateful that they put that collection together and I used many of the poems that you'll hear today are from that book. Um, I also used some history books, Inglewood Lives by Diana Harris. And Diana Harris did a lot of original interviews with um, settlers and so forth, so that's really wonderful. And then two other history books by Lindsay Williams and U.S. Cleveland. They're called Our Fascinating Past, Charlotte Harbor, The Early Years, and Our Fascinating Past, Charlotte Harbor, The Later Years. All right, I'm going to start, as far as Inglewood history, I think that we have to start with Indian Mound Park. It is a very unique feature of Inglewood. I'm so happy that it has been preserved and the Indian Mound there has been preserved. So it's a Sarasota County Park. It also had the name at one point in history of Paulson Point. So the people who lived there were part of the Manasota culture and that went from about 1000 BC to 1350 AD. So the pottery sherds that have been found there, um, shell tools, decorated shells, and lots of bones. There have been some human uh, remains that have come from that mound, but I'm just going to put that aside because that's a whole nother um, discussion for an archeologist or anthropologist or both. Um, and I'm going to talk about a poem. So these were the people who were living here when the Spanish people first came to Florida. And one of those Spanish people was Bartolome de Flores. And he was here, well, his work dates from about 1571. And his book is called, and please forgive my Spanish, Obra nu Nuva Mente Compueste, means new composed work. So this is a poem about Florida that he wrote and it was translated by William Richard Jackson. This fertile paradise. And in order to better to describe it, I wish to tell of the expanse of be the beauty and loveliness of this fertile paradise and of its people and its nature. It is a new world full of charms and comely with many diverse colors, a flowered and delightful meadow with birds of a thousand kinds. So wish some of those birds were flying around us now, but I'm sure you've seen plenty of them in your uh, time around Florida. All right, so that the Spanish held Florida. It was a Spanish colony. And there were um, some things that happened that led to Florida becoming a United States territory. And the main one was the First Seminole War. So um, this was a conflict uh, that was pushed forward by Andrew Jackson. He brought, came from Tennessee with the Tennessee militia into Florida. And the idea was that they were going to recover some slaves who had escaped from the southern colonies into Florida and so on and so forth. And, and I could tell long stories about this. I'm just going to give you the brief version. So that first Seminole War went from 1817 to 1818. In 1819, the uh, Congress ratifies the Adams-Onis Treaty and the U.S. acquires Florida, but the handover doesn't take place until 1821. Now, Andrew Jackson was our first territorial governor, and he was only governor about long enough to accept that changeover of the, of the flags from the Spanish to the United States. Um, and then our second governor was Governor Duval. Uh, but Andrew Jackson is intimately integrated into Florida history. So when he became president, um, he pushed through Congress some legislation called the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And it basically said that 
we would like to, the United States, it's two paragraphs, the United States government would like to trade land that they own that's west of the Mississippi for land that the Indians own that is east of the Mississippi. It says nothing about war or making war to get this goal. Um, but that's what happened. So everybody knows about the Trail of Tears with the Cherokees and so forth, but this was our own Trail of Tears here in Florida. So the Seminole Indians, now after those early people who had built those Indian mounds lived here, um, they were devastated by diseases that the Europeans brought, by slavery and um, by uh, just all kinds of other things pretty much by the beginning of the 18th century, there weren't any here anymore. So we, we were still a Spanish colony then, so the Spaniards actually invited the Indians who were in the southern states, that would be uh, southern Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi, actually invited them to come down into Florida. So they became separated from their tribes and they became known as Seminoles. So Seminoles comes from a kind of Spanish word, cimarrone, that means separated or divided. There are lots of definitions to it, but the Seminole languages don't have the letter R in them, so that when the Seminoles said it, it didn't come out semarone, it became out seminole. And that is how we got the Seminole Indians. So this was, this Indian Removal Act affected them, and we had the Second Seminole War between 1835 and 1842. So it was the longest, costliest, and most bloody, meaning the most deaths and the most people who died of all the wars of Indian removal right here in Florida. It was actually called the Florida War. So at the end of that war in 1842, the United States government pretty much just said uncle, gave up, because they signed an executive order and just said we don't want to fight anymore. So before that war, we think there were about maybe 5,000 Seminoles in Florida. Um, maybe 3,000 were relocated to um, what's today Oklahoma. And that Trail of Tears in Florida meant they were rounded up, put on a boat at Fort Brooke, which is Tampa today. They went up to New Orleans. They were put on another boat. They went up the Mississippi to the Red River, put on another boat, and then sent out the Red River all the way to Oklahoma if there was enough water in the Red River to float the boat, and if there was not, they walked. So that was a long journey for people who had been living in Florida for several generations. So at the end of the war, we think um, that 3,000 of them had been relocated. Um, most of them, maybe 2, 000, around 2,000 or more, had uh, died of disease or death or um, been killed in a battle. and there was maybe a couple hundred left in Florida. So um, they actually, so people, white people started coming down into Florida. And many of those soldiers who had fought in that Second Seminole War, uh, there are a lot of militia fought in it, they saw how beautiful this fertile paradise, just like uh, Flore said. They saw this wonderful place to live and they wanted to come back here. So settlements started coming down and as it did, there were pressures of surveys because in order to sell land, the United States government has to survey it. So government surveys started coming down and they started coming down into the land that was reserved for the Seminoles, a reservation, if you will. And so the first, first surveys were done in 1843. The war had just ended in 1842. So in 1855, that sort of erupted and uh, turned into the Third Seminole War. The, this war was fought very differently than the Second Seminole War, and at the end of it, uh, less than 100 had been uh, relocated to Oklahoma. And how many were left? Nobody knows, because they weren't going to tell the government how many were left. They were hiding in the Everglades, pretty much. And that's pretty much how the Seminoles ended up in the very southern part of Florida because nobody else wanted it. <laughs> so that's the way it happened. So all of the Seminoles in Florida today are descended from that remnant that was left after that third Seminole War. 
Um, and then, of course, we had the United States Civil War. That took place from 1861 to 1865. But I'm a little bit ahead of myself because I did want to share with you, I did want to share with you a poem uh, written by a Seminole. Um, and this is, um, this is called Major Dade. So the, the very opening battle of the Second Seminole War, so this is the one in 1835, um, the very opening battle uh, was with a man named uh, Major Francis Dade. In fact, if you go Dade, that sounds like a Florida county, you're right, that it was named for him in, in commemoration or memory of him. So um, this was written by Moses Jumper Jr., um, a Seminole. And um, so what happened is there was a, what they call the Indian Agency, and it was at what's Ocala today. Um, it was called Fort King then. And so they, you know, the Seminoles, they were trying to convince them to move out west, but they were not agreeing to do it. And there was some, um, what do I want to say, just, um, rumors that there was going to be trouble so they wanted to reinforce Fort King so Major Dade started at Fort Brook which is Tampa and he marched a hundred soldiers uh, with artillery and an artillery company all the way from Fort Brook uh, up to Fort King and he was ambushed on the way by the Seminoles and um, he just about everybody died there were I think five survivors or very few like that um, so uh, Major, Major Dade uh, was killed in that battle. So this poem is called Major Dade. Major Dade, Major Dade, what happened to your brigade? It seems, sir, you have taken the wrong turn. And now it seems that it's your time to burn. You have tried to chase the native from his land. You killed, captured, and tried to shame the people of the Seminole Band. Major Dade, Major Dade, this is where your body's laid. Your family will weep, but do they really know why? Or did you tell them about the native women and children you made cried? You led the blue coats against the native and made many a fatherless son. But today, Major Dade, the medicine too strong, you can't shoot what you can't see with your mighty gun. Major Dade, Major Dade, what happened to the blue coats raid? Did you think the red man had run out of time when you marched those hundred men from the Florida state line? Were you going to rid Florida and cause the Seminole to fall? Pesky Indians, let's kill them all. Major Dade, Major Dade, the name in the history books you've made. Oh yes, it's there in black and white. And we know who really won the fight. In your books, you win a great battle and it becomes historical lore. The Indian wins, and it's a massacre of the heathens have started another bloody war. Major Dade, Major Dade, the trust we must never let fade. Major Dade, Major Dade, this is where your body is laid. Yeah, a really phenomenal poet, um, Moses Jumper Jr., and his book is called Echoes in the Wind. All right, so after that, um, after the, the Civil War, that would be 1861 to 1865. Now, remember Florida's role in the United States Civil War. We had a blockade all the way around our coast, a Union blockade. We were part of the Confederate States of America. There was a blockade all around the coast. There were skirmishes along the coast. There were a couple of uh, battles, the Battle of Alusty or Ocean Pond, the Battle of Natural Bridge. But for the most part, Florida's role during this, the uh, United States Civil War was to supply food. So we had all these cattle that were left over from when the Spanish were here and trying to have ranches along uh, in the northern part of the state. And they had become feral and pretty much right there for anybody to um, scoop up and um, round up and those cattle were driven to the railhead at Baldwin and they were put on trains and sent north as far as they could go to feed 
uh, uh, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. So that was basically what Florida's role in that United States Civil War was. So it took about a decade after that for the first settlers to come to the Inglewood area. And they got here in about 1878. That was William and Mary Goff and their four daughters. How did they get here? They arrived by schooner, <laughs> a kind of a boat or ship. And again, that was the, the basic way that you got to Florida. The overland routes, there were some, um, but they were difficult and long and treacherous. So um, boat travel was the preferred. We didn't yet have many railroads. So they purchased the land that is now West Dearborn Street, and they opened a store there and um, uh, just had their homestead and so on there. And later, uh, when the uh, Nichols family took over, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, and then the Buchan family took over, schooners were the ones who supplied the stores. That's how they got the goods uh, for their stores. And so I want to do a poem that's from a really wonderful uh, book called The Folk Songs of Florida, and it's by Alton uh, C. Morris collected all these wonderful songs. And of course, um, a song is just a poem set to music. Um, and this one is called The Seaman's Alphabet. That's S-E-A-M-A-N apostrophe S, uh, alphabet. Um, and as with alphabet books and absidariuses and all the other things that are organized by the alphabet, you have to figure out something for each letter of the alphabet. So listen, because X is always a trial. And um, this was recalled, this song was recalled by uh, Mildred Masters of Punta Gorda. And uh, she learned it from a man who first fished commercially up and down the um, west coast of Florida. So um, I'm gonna sing this now in Mr. Um, Mr. Morse's uh, book, there are no, uh, um, there's no music recorded for this song. So I made up this tune um, and I'm gonna try to do it for you now. Um, so there is a chorus and it should come after every verse, but I'm gonna sing four verses and then do a chorus and then do the three last verses and then the chorus again. So I'm, I'm uh, hurrying it through a little bit. A is the anchor and that we know, B is the bowsprit that's over the bow, C is the capstan by which we go round, D is the deck where the crew is found, E for the ensign or a top mission flew, F for the foxhole where lives the crew, G for the gunnels by which we do stand, H for the hawser that never will strand. I for the eye bolt that fits in our deck, D J for the jib we often do set, K for the keel way down in the hold, L for the lanyard that ever will hold, M for the mainmast so long, stout and strong, N for the needle that never points wrong, O for the oars in our jolly boat, P for the pennant that ever will float. So merry, so merry, so merry are we, no mortal on earth like a sailor at sea. Hi dearie, hi dearie, hi dearie down, give a sailor his grog and there's nothing goes wrong. Q is the quarter deck where our captain stood, R for the rigging that always is good, S for the stillyards where we weigh our beef, T for the topsails we sometimes do reef, U for the union we all do adore, V for the beaver that points on before, W for the weaver that gives us our time, and three more letters will give us our rhyme. X on our ship, it has no place. Y for the yard arms, we often do brace. Z for the zinc, way down on the bottom. So bosun, give us our grog and we'll all go below. So merry, so merry, so merry are we. No mortal on earth like a sailor at sea. Hi dearie, hi dearie, hi dearie down. Give a sailor his grog and there's nothing goes wrong. Okay, <laughs> well, that was fun. Thank you all for listening to me sing. It just seems like a song should be sung. Okay, I wanna talk about Grove City, even it's in the Inglewood area here. 
and uh, Grove City was founded by a man named John Cross. Now, John Cross belongs to my county, DeSoto County. Um, he founded a town there named after his native place, the place where he was born. That's Liverpool, England. Uh, he founded Liverpool in DeSoto County. He also was active in Punta Gorda. In fact, uh, let's see, Tamiami Trail, US 41 southbound in Punta Gorda is called Cross Street. So he was a busy man, both in uh, Liverpool, um, in Arcadia, in Punta Gorda, and founded Grove City. So he purchased property from Hamilton Diston. Now I could tell you the long story of the Diston purchase, but I'm gonna let that go and be something you can look up if you're interested. Uh, but at one point, Hamilton Diston purchased from, all, from the state of Florida all the swamp and over, what they called overflowed lands that existed. And um, it got Florida out of debt and allowed railroads to be built in Florida. And this really aided the settlement and development of uh, especially Southwest Florida and Inglewood. So um, he, bought, he bought that land and he platted Grove City in 1886. Of course, Inglewood, part of Inglewood um, belonged to uh, DeSoto County and part of Inglewood belonged to Manatee County at that time. So um, he decided that each home should have a lot and that each home should have extra acres for citrus cultivation. Now, there were all kinds of citrus back in those days, but he really encouraged lemon cultivation. And he did so because in order to prevent scurvy on sailing ships, they took on huge quantities of lemons and ate those to get the vitamin C because vitamin C will keep you from getting scurvy. And so all of the sailing ships and navies and commercial vessels and everything, and please go back in time with me when that was all very important, they all wanted lemons. And so he thought the settlers would make a killing because those lemons that they sold in Spain were so expensive, especially when they imported them to the United States. So if we could have an inexpensive source of lemons right here in Florida, why we would make it rich, we would make rich. So um, he's probably the one who named Lemon Bay, Lemon Bay, because he really wanted to encourage all of that lemon cultivation. He also sponsored an exhibit in Chicago in 1893, and that was the Chicago World's Fair also known as the Columbian Expedition. Now, if you all remember your history, it's the anniversary of the coming over of Christopher Columbus. That's why they called it the Columbian Exposition. Um, but that should have been 1892. Well, they were still planning it in 1892, so it actually took place in 1893. Um, and I've got a really nice postcard view of it for you to look at. Um, just so you get a sense of what that was. A World's Fair was really an amazing thing back in those days. Well, some people who became well known in Inglewood history visited the Columbia Exposition. One of them was Ferdinand Gottfried. Um, he had a friend who bought land in Grove City and he asked um, Ferdinand, Mr. Gottfried, to go to Florida um, to build him a house because his wife was sick and he wanted a, a climate that was just this beautiful, sunny, warm climate to help with her illness. Remember, we didn't have the medicines that we have today to help people, even penicillin back then. So, um, so Godfrey came down, but he said the Grove City was no place for a sick wife because it wasn't, there were no amenities there whatsoever. There was the climate, but there was nothing else. So um, he, but he himself stayed here. Gottfried Creek in Inglewood is named for him. And he also helped build that Grove City Land Company Hotel. Some other people um, that you will know for your, from your Inglewood history are Herbert, Howard, and Ira Nichols. They bought many, many acres of Grove City and they wanted to sell it as a one acre plot for your house and 10 acres for your grove. And they, so they had all the one acre plots together in the city and then the 10 acre grove was sort of outside the city. 
Um, so they did that for a while, then they ended up selling out and moving to Inglewood, um, surprisingly there. So I want to do a poem for you um, from uh, by Walt Whitman. Uh, Walt Whitman is one of our uh, Renaissance uh, poets. He is really um, one of the very first poets that the United States can claim wholly as its own, unfluenced by the European po poetical tradition. Um, he wrote in a, in a very, um, what do I want to call it, uh, open style, no rhyme. He, it, his verse is very metrical, but it's not um, regular um, uh, metrical. He, he um, uses the cadences uh, from the Bible. Um, more like. So this is his poem and it's called Orange Buds by Mail from Florida. And one of the things I have to tell you, um, he makes reference to Voltaire. And this is the famous philosopher Voltaire, who once closed an argument by claiming that a ship of war and the Grand Opera were proofs enough of France's progress and civilization. Oh, if Voltaire could see us today. <laughs> Okay, this is called Orange Buds by Mail from Florida. And this is one of the poems that I have memorized, so I'm going to try to recite it for you. Of course, you'll be able to see it on the slide and see if I mess up. But I will tell you that I really believe in memorizing poems, because once you memorize a poem, whether it's one you wrote or whether it's one somebody else wrote, it's yours, and nobody can ever take it away from you. And when you're standing in line in the grocery store or the post office or whatever else, you can have that poem to entertain you and to bring um, solace and comfort to you and whatever else you get out of poetry, um, all your own. So this is Orange Buds by Mail from Florida by Walt Whitman. A lesser proof than old Voltaire's, yet greater proof of this present time, and thee, thy broad expanse, America. To my plain northern hut, outside in clouds and snow, brought safely a thousand miles o'er land and tide, some three days since in their own soil, live sprouting. Now here, their sweetness in my room unfolding, a bunch of orange buds by mail from Florida. All right, well, that is just, you know, if you've ever been around when those um, citrus, when that citrus is blooming, it's really worth <laughs> being in the grove. All right, well, so Inglewood was coming up at this time. Inglewood wasn't incorporated until 1925, um, but it was, um, it was developing and it was pretty much a, a fishing village, if you will um, be able to call it that. Uh, there was commercial fishing and there was sports fishing. And during the Great Depression, and I'm skipping ahead just a little bit because this is such a nice tidbit. So um, the, the um, Works Progress Administration uh, came up with something called the Federal Writers Project. So each state had a bunch of writers because, you know, everybody was unemployed, including the writers and artists. So they hired these writers to go around and find out everything they could about the state, to interview people, talk to people, collect folk stories. Um, find out about the different places, what was there, and they wrote guidebooks. So the uh, Florida Guide, uh, uh, yeah, it's called Guide, uh, Florida Guide to the Southernmost State, I believe is the actual title of the book. But it's just wonderful. It's been reprinted. You can get it at your library. Um, so this is how they describe Inglewood in that book. Quote, Inglewood is a favorite headquarters for tarpon fishing. Placida is a small fishing village built around an Indian mound. Fishing boats and guides available inquire at post office. And this was back in the day, of course, when post, office, when post offices were hubs of the community. Maybe it's not so much that way anymore. Um, so, he de so I did mention Placida, which was also a little fishing uh, village. And I want to do a poem by Richard Brobst. 
And um, Richard Brobes is, has passed away now, but he was in Inglewood for many, many years. He edited a poetry magazine called The Albatross, and he had a business right there in downtown Inglewood. And he was a terrific poet, just a fabulous poet. So this is one of his poems, and it's called Placida. There is no scholarly language of pretense in the fish house, only an educated guess now and then coming from the salt-whiskered man in the corner, wiping blood and scales from his hands. He knows the tide by the smell of oysters and by which direction the egrets circle to land. When he commands, Pompano are running, or reds in the flats at dusk, the wisest among us do not bother with why. But here, the spoken word is scarce. He works the jagged edges off of days, 17, 14 in a row, where one ends, where the next begins, matter little. What matters is the current of the moon measured out in childish notches from his pick upon the ice room wall, a calendar without numbers, a primitive, accurate testimonial of a man's life among crates of broken fish. The last time we came in a pack to buy Jack's at 2 a.m., he had his lunch out and was sharing a sandwich with a raccoon. And they shared the language of smell and another sense unknown that comes only to those who have mingled their blood among scallops and rays. When we left with our half-frozen fish sucking the ink off its newspaper wrap, he was leaning against the scales in his rubber boots in a cement pool of oily water. He said nothing to us that night as many other nights when he spoke only a nod when he spoke only with a nod and knife. That is how we learned that he hid his greatest knowledge in silence. That is the language he spoke with raccoons, pelicans, and mullet, the language of truth with no margin for error. Thanks, Richard. Great poem. I want to mention Manasota Lumber Company's uh, Woodmere. So this was a settlement that was built around a sawmill and a big lumber operation. The plat for Woodmere was actually filed in 1918. They had a commissary, a schools, a doctor, a movie theater, dining room, electricity in the houses. Um, now, Nocatee Crate Mill, which is in the town that I live in, up in DeSoto uh, County, was also a big lumber company and so forth. And they actually hired a caretaker um, for Woodmere. So I think the two companies were um, somehow connected to each other. The sawmill closed in 1923. In 1926, they salvaged all, all of the equipment and the actual lumber complex burned in about 1930 and all the remaining buildings were sold. There are still some houses from the Woodmere um, Village Settlement Company uh, uh, town uh, that exist in the Inglewood area. Um, and I want to read a poem because you know the, the pines and uh, we actually have a couple around here, beautiful pine trees, are just one of Florida's fabulous resources. And um, there were many, many of them in the early, early days. Um, and there are not ma many because many of them were cut down by places like Woodmere. But uh, Zora Neale Hurston uh, wrote a beautiful piece about it. Now this is not actually a poem, although it is extremely poetic. So she wrote this in her autobiography that's called Dust Tracks on a Road. So Zora Neale Hurston grew up in Eatonville, Florida. It was the earliest all African-American incorporated town in Florida. It may be one of the earliest ones in the entire United States. 
And um, then she went to Howard University in uh, Washington, D.C. And after she got her bachelor's degree, she wanted to study with the great anthropologist Franz Boas at Columbia University, which she did. And he said, Zora, what you need to do is go back to Florida and collect all the stories and folklore and everything from there. And she did, and we're very lucky that she did. But anyway, I can do a whole program on Zora Neale Hurston too, but let's just leave her there for the, the time being. This is her memory of growing up outside of, um, in Eatonville, Florida, um, about the pine trees. The wind would sow through the tops of the tall, long leaf pines and say things to me. I put in the words that the sounds put into me, like woo, woo, you, woo. The tree was talking to me even when I did not catch the words. It was talking and telling me things. I have mentioned the tree near our house that got so friendly I named it the Loving Pine. Finally, all of my playmates called it that too. I used to take a seat at the foot of that tree and play for hours without any toys. We talked about everything in my world. Sometimes we just took it out in singing songs. That tree had a mighty fine bass voice when it really took a notion to let it out. There was another tree that used to creep up close to the house around sundown and threaten me. It used to put on a skull head with a crown on it every day at sundown and make motions at me when I had to go out on the back porch to wash my feet after supper before going to bed. It never bothered around during the day. It was just another pine tree about a hundred feet tall then standing head and shoulders above a grove. But let the dusk begin to fall and it would put that crown on its skull and creep in close. Nobody else ever seemed to notice what it was up to but me. I used to wish it would go off somewhere and get lost, but every evening I would have to look to see, and every time it would be right there, sort of shaking and shivering and bowing its head at me. I used to wonder if sometime it was not going to come in the house. And again, that's from Dust Tracks on a Road um, by Zora Neale Hurston. All right, well, we're coming up to the year 1921, and we certainly have to mention county division. So there was um, this very large county known as DeSoto County. It was created in 1887, and out of that county was carved today the counties that are Charlotte, DeSoto, Glades, Hardy, and Highlands. A really huge um, county divided up into now five counties. Um, that was also the year that Sarasota and Manatee counties were divided. So originally Sarasota and Manatee and those five counties I just named were all in one big county named Manatee County. So in 1887, they split off the eastern part, made DeSoto County, and then in 1921, we got the five counties, including Charlotte, and we got Sarasota and Manatee uh, split apart as well. All right, well, we're coming into the 20s, and that's pretty much where we're going to, um, how far we're going to go up in time. So the 1920s was a decade full of hurricanes. Now, um, the native Floridians don't say hurricane, like I just said, they call them hurricanes. And it's hard for me to get it just exactly right. Um, but if you ever hear somebody say it, you'll know, you'll recognize it. So we had the Tampa Bay hurricane of October 25th, 1921, right there, uh, just a few months after county division. We had the Okeechobee hurricane of 1926. That was the one that pretty much impacted the Southwest uh, part of Florida, including Inglewood. In fact, they actually had to um, they actually had to move uh, from what became the Nichols store and the Buckins store. They actually had to move uh, inland a little bit because it got inundated during that hurricane. Uh, there was the so um, it was pretty. The 1926 hurricane was pretty devastating. Lake Okeechobee came out of its banks and rolled to the west, so it destroyed Moorhaven, which was the county seat, still is the county seat of Glades County, um, and killed many, many people. In the Miami hurricane of 1928, the wind came in the opposite direction, pushed the lake onto the eastern shore, and um, 
inundated Bean City and Pahokee and all those uh, little places on the eastern side, uh, plus killed lots of people in Miami. So we actually had the Great Depression come to Florida early because we didn't have to wait for the stock market crash. We were already suffering from two hurricanes only two years apart. Uh, they were both in September, by the way, September of 1926 and then September of 1928. And then, of course, the stock market crash in 1929. Um, I did want to do another song for you. I'm not going to sing this one. Um, this is by the great um, poet, storyteller, and songwriter, Will McLean. Um, and it's called Hold Back the Waters. So um, this, is, um, this is probably about that 1928 hurricane. The Seminole left there in haste and with speed. Their wise words of warning were given no heed. When the waters receded, great God, what a sight. Men, women, and children turned black as the night. Here's the chorus. Lord, hold back the waters of Lake Okeechobee, for Lake Okeechobee's blue waters are cold. When wild winds are blowing across Okeechobee, they're calling and seeking for other poor souls. Oh, Lake Okeechobee's blue waters are cold. Now, Lake Okeechobee is calm and serene. The land all around it is fertile and green. But the people get fearful when the wild winds do roam. They look at that earth dam and they think of their home. All right, um, now, um, really, so the 1920s, besides being a decade of hurricanes, was also a decade of road building, and probably the most famous road to be built was the Tammy Ammie Trail. And Inglewood got the nickname the Little City at the turn of the trail because the Tammy Ammie Trail went right through Inglewood. Now you're going to say, hey, Carol, I've got to tell you something. It does not, but it did at one time. Okay, so um, they first came up with the idea for the Tamiami Trail in 1923. Now, Tamiami is actually a portmanteau word. So we took the word Tampa and the word Miami and we put them together. And so we took the end off of Tampa and we made the Tamiami Trail. And that's how the name came from because the highway was supposed to go from Tampa all the way to Miami. Um, so, um, when Ingle was, was incorporated in 1923, it was 13 square miles. It was a huge place. And um, six miles of the Tamiami Trail went right through Inglewood. And it went right on Dearborn Street. So, when they opened the uh, trail, um, in 1928, Florida Governor John W. Martin and the motorcade visited every town along the way. They did a speech on the front porch of Ziegler's store. It was built in 1923. I believe it's still standing on Dearborn Street. And those speechifiers that day promised that the Tamiami Trail would always go through Inglewood. So, all that road building, I want to do a wonderful poem by uh, the poet Langston Hughes. Now, Langston Hughes never lived in Florida, but he visited here very often. He was friends with Mary McLeod Bethune, um, who founded uh, Bethune Cookman College that's still in existence over on the northeast uh, coast of Florida. Um, but anyway, he liked to write poems. Um, that were sort of where he took on the persona of somebody else. So imagine that the speaker of this poem is working, making a road. Now, what does making a road mean back in those days? Hard and heavy work. So grubbing out palmettos and packing down a shell or clay. It was hard, hot, dusty work. Okay, so this is called Florida Road Workers. I'm making a road for the cars to fly by on. Making a road through the palmetto thicket for light and civilization to travel on. Making a road for the rich old white men to sweep over in their big cars and leave me standing here. Sure, a road helps all of us. White folks ride and I get to see them ride. I ain't never seen nobody ride so fine before. Hey, buddy, look at me. I'm making a road. 
All right, now that's from his uh, collected poems, so the collected poems of Langston Hughes. All right, well, that's pretty much the end of the decade. Of course, we had the stock market crash and the Great Depression and World War II. That's all for another day and another time. Thank you all very much for listening to me today. Thank you.